I'm Bjorn Fallon. I will uh, host this um, stand-up comedy show called TypeSafe C++. Cheers. Um, before I begin, a uh, show of hands, who thinks C++ is a type-safe language? <laughs> okay, there were a few. Okay, who thinks it's absolutely not a type-safe language? Fewer hands, that was surprising. Okay, interesting. Um, so we'll have a great show, I hope. Very much fun. And those of you who were uncertain, um, why were you uncertain? What is type safety to begin with? Can you give me a, an idea? How do we define it? Peter? Well, type safety means if your program runs, it does what it should do. OK, so, <laughs> so, so if I have a logic error, then it's not type safe. Or <laughs> some other ideas about how we can define what type safety is, yes? You can use the type system to make things you don't want to be used to not compile. I can use the type system to make things I don't want to be able to do to not even compile. That is a good one. I like that. Yes? And if there are no undefined behavior. No undefined behavior, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can see where you're going. <laughs> uh, other ideas? Type errors are caught at compile time. That, that is, yes, I agree. I agree. Peter? Well, there are languages where the type system is completely dynamic, so... Yes. Good. <laughs> Good, Peter. Yes. There are, there are languages that I would say are type safe, but they are completely runtime typed. So we can talk about compile time type safety and runtime type safety. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, this is, we were puzzled. This is what the dictionary says: the extent to which a programming language discourages or prevents type errors. I think this is really interesting. The extent. So there are degrees. So you can have poor type safety, so-so type safety, quite good type safety, really, really good type safety discourages or prevents. I guess we can say that in a language like C++, where we can do type punning and reinterpret code, we can just forget about absolute type safety. We, we cannot protect against Machiavelli. But we can maybe protect against uh, honest mistakes. And type errors is also interesting. What is a type error? Well, I hope we can um, get somewhere with this. We'll, we'll see. Um, my take on this is that a type safe system is something that discourages or prevents the use of one type when another is intended. Uh, that discourages or prevents operations that don't make any sense. Uh, any here who is familiar with the uh, POSIX APIs? POSIX. POSIX. Yeah. What operations make sense to do on a file descriptor? <laughs> Close, yeah. Yeah. Close. Uh, and the rest of them sort of depends. Um, arithmetic. Subtract two file descriptors, uh, multiply them. Uh, I guess we can already conclude that POSIX could have chosen a better type for a file descriptor than an int. No. <laughs> Peter disagrees. Yeah, because Unix had that ever. Yeah. They started out without having a real type system Yeah, sure, given history. We have, a, we have a history and we cannot undo history, so it was like... Was it Lisa Lippincott who mentioned that the other day, that we, we have no ideas how to solve this without also including a time machine? Uh, the use of values outside the defined space. I remember fondly, as a young teenager, I finally learned a real proper programming language, Pascal. And I could say that 
This is a type, it's an in integer type. It has all values between one and six inclusively. Perfect for modeling dyes. I actually don't remember what happened if you did go outside the range. I think it terminated the program, but well. So I guess I just sneaked past the introduction. Uh, here is what I intend to talk about now. So I'm going to look at what, what the language says and some experiments. And then I'm going to show you a very simple, super simple actually, uh, library solution for strong types. And then I'll very briefly walk you through some libraries that uh, exist on GitHub and see what, what they can offer. And then we'll look at what happens with your code when you start using strong types because I guess already spoiled it, we we can actually have very strong type safety. You just need to know what to do. And this will be mixed with uh, some war stories, some uh, random information bits I found on the internet, uh, and uh, at least one moment of amazing shame for myself. Um, but yeah, that's what we're going to do. So type safety in C++. My story begins here. Um, I work for a company named NetInsight. We make networking equipment, and this was a few years ago, uh, actually quite, quite a few years ago now. Uh, we were implementing a communications protocol, and one thing we needed, this code is of course simplified beyond belief, but it's just to give you the idea. So we had a request ID that we used to keep track of a request that is sent and getting an acknowledge so we know which to pair with, with, with which. And one thing we also had was a receiver ID. I could add a new receiver to a data flow or remove a receiver from a data flow. And I wanted to create a remove request. So for this, I issue the function remove with the request ID and a receiver ID and encapsulated this in a simple function, initiate remove. Has so any of you made this mistake? Or am I the only one? Uh, no, nobody does that except me, no. Damn, I wish I was as good as you are. Uh, there was one person who raised his hand. What did you do? Yeah. So one takes two iterators, uh, one into the list that you're calling member of, and one into the list that you're passing in. I remember the iterators from the last game. I remember the iterators from the different lists. Yeah. That is actually a difficult one because the iterators are both of the same type, aren't they? Yeah. So that, that, is, that is a difficult one. I have a good one. Okay. So I that would execute every few milliseconds and these batches would process several uh, thousand records at a time. So obviously I, uh, the, the batches process five records at a time and run every 3,000, 300 milliseconds, a thousand milliseconds, which, so the whole thing took a very, very long time. Okay, so, so you, to, to summarize in case you didn't hear, the, if I remember correctly, you, you issued batch jobs essentially and you had the wrong unit of time so I mixed this batch size and the unit of time. mixed batch size and uh, time <laughs> yeah that's a bad one uh, what did you do about it when you found the bug it, it, it was before there was a chrono in, in, yeah. in the yeah. standard library well I, I fixed it by reversing but I didn't okay. see yeah. <laughs> okay so you you swap the parameter order and then you hope that this was a once in a lifetime experience and it will never happen again. Yeah, so, I'm ashamed of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is actually my reaction too. I felt very embarrassed. Um, but what I did was I wanted actually to see is there anything I can do to prevent this from happening? Is it possible? So 
just as a thought experiment, I have this function b, this function func that takes a b and calls another function with that b, but the other takes an a. When is this call allowed? Well, we cannot say, can we? Because we have no idea what a and b are. So in this case, yeah, this is perfectly legal. Uh, an enum, a C style enum is really just a glorified integer and ints are implicitly convertible to double. So sorry, I pulled your leg. There's nothing type safe in C++. Go away. Or is it? In this case, then, is this call allowed? No. Why? The types are exactly the same, aren't they? It's a struct with one value of type int. They are identical, but it's not allowed. Because they are not the same type. Pardon, what did you say on it? No conversions, excellent. So if I want this to compile, I can add a constructor in A that takes a, a B. That works, providing I'm not making that constructor explicit, then it doesn't work anyway. Or I can have a conversion operator from A to B, provided it's not explicit. Or I can make B inherit publicly from A, though that would also work. But this is an interesting insight. For types that I have made myself, uh, there is no automatic conversion. Everything is forbidden, unless I have explicitly made a choice to allow it. So if we take this uh, stupid mistake and just change it to say that request ID is a struct that holds a value, and receiver ID is also a struct that holds a value, and I have this same silly mistake, then I get a compilation error. No matching fun function call to remove candidate function not viable, no known conversion from receiver ID to request ID. That, that is good, isn't it? So it didn't really take a lot to at least make a fairly good improvement to the type safety. I wouldn't say this is anywhere near it done, but it's definitely something. So we have control. We decide. We are like medieval rulers. We make the laws that we want to provided we follow the Holy Scripture that is the ISO standard. So only the things we explicitly say that we want to allow are allowed. So maybe we should do this a bit more uh, sophisticated. So I want to pri private data so that, that is hidden from tinkering that shouldn't be there. Maybe we want uh, equality comparison. Uh, these are actually used in a stood map, so it operates less than it makes sense, and some other stuff. This works fine. And at this point, I had prepared something like 30 slides of uh, the greatness of the C17 feature of enum class with no enumeration names, because it is usable as an integer type that is not convertible back and forth. I said had made about 30 slides about it because then Olafur's uh, fruit salad happened. Have you heard about Olafur's fruit salad? In a thread on Twitter about the enormous elegance of using enum class, Olafur Vage posted this link to Matt Godbold's Compiler Explorer. And Pete Bindles reacted, did you just slice an orange into an apple? I had to click the link, didn't I? So I found this code. Enum class orange, enum class apple, an orange is four, an apple is three. We create an apple X from an orange. Ouch. This compiles. It doesn't even give a warning. Ouch. Shafiq, 
I'm mispronouncing that name at least as bad as uh, Olafers. Uh, points to the proposal that presumably broke this. Uh, Richard Smith seems to agree. Uh, I believe this is going to be handled as a, a, a core issue. I checked the core issue list uh, yesterday evening and I couldn't find it, but honestly, I just read on the phone, so I might have missed it. Uh, Our first reaction is, of course, perfect. Did I just find a bug in the standard? Um, so hopefully, next time I'm doing this presentation, I will instead talk about how great enum class is, but for the moment, I don't think I want to recommend that because of this problem. So it's back to writing all this code, which includes a fairly unpleasant amount of uh, boilerplate code, especially since we want to repeat it again for request ID. Questions before I go on? I, I forgot to say, by the way, just interrupt at any time if, you, if there is something you're wondering about. Hmm? Yeah, that is debatably sane. Uh, it, yeah, it, sh it probably should be explicit. It should, uh, yeah, for the recording, if you didn't hear, the conversion operator to unsigned int there should, would probably be better uh, as explicit, I agree. Yeah. So the, the observation is that it, it, it makes sense to have some named way to, to get the value uh, rather than relying on conversion operators because that leads you to ugly costs and stuff uh, at times. And I agree, absolutely. And uh, we'll get to that in a while. Okay. So... After I had done this uh, experimentation, I started thinking about how can I make a library that removes this boilerplate code, this uh, repetition. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is a, a super simplification of something I did at work. Uh, but I hope I haven't simplified it beyond the recognition, broken it. Uh, so what I did was this. I, I created a class, a class template, safe type, where T is the type I wanted to represent. And then I have a tag type. And the tag type is used solely for discriminating between, say I have two safe types of int, but they are not the same. And if they have different tags, then, they are not, then the safe type is not the same. So I can have a constructor, I have a conversion operator. We can debate if they should be explicit or not. And I added this one, uh, a template constructor for, for cross-construction that is deleted. So if you have another safe type that doesn't really match, then it won't compile. Uh, this does not match the uh, copy constructor or move constructor, by the way. It, it, it just works. And then you have to repeat similar delete tricks for, for uh, assignment operator, maybe for comparison operators. Uh, it's, uh, that's a matter of taste, I guess. Probably for comparison operators. But we get a fair... We get a long way with this. So the way you use it is define your type in, in this case my int1 is a safe type of int with struct int1 underscore. And int2 is a safe type of int and struct int2 underscore. So this struct int1 underscore, it just, it, it creates a new type there. Or rather, it declares the existence of a new type there. And that is enough, because we're not actually using the tag for anything. It just needs a name of a type. So that is actually enough. 
So int1 and int2 are both safe types that holds integer values, but they are different types. We cannot construct them one from the other by accident. We can do it with cast and, and such. Victor? Uh, could I have used a non-type template parameter for tag? Yes, I could, but it's very inconvenient. I'll get to why. But, it, but I could. I could. So back to this well-established code sample now, um, using a request ID that is a safe UIN32 with struct request ID tag, a receiver ID UIN32T with receiver ID tag, and the same accidental swap. And we see that request ID tag and receiver ID tag, they're, they're different types. They're different names. And I get a compilation error. No matching function call to remove. Candidate function not viable. No known conversion from safe type blah, 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 receiver ID tag to safe type blah, 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 request ID tag. It's not ideal, but it's not bad. And we saved a lot of boilerplate code. So, yeah, why not? But we can do one better. Who is familiar with the curiously recurring template pattern? OK, I should, I should turn that around. Who is not familiar with it? <laughs> one hand. I'll, I'll give you a very, very brief. Uh, Introduction. Uh, curiously recurring template parameter idiom. Curiously recurring template parameter idiom. OK. Uh, you're probably right. It, it's been, I, I bought Copleen's book in the summer of 93, and I haven't read it since, so I, I misremember. <laughs> 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 like yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's an idiom. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the, the curiosity here is in the recursion that request ID inherits from a type, from a template instantiated on request ID. So request ID is sort of defined in terms of itself. But as you saw earlier, the tag type is not used. It's just there to discriminate, seeing that two safe types do not have the same. Uh, have the same tag. And after struct request ID colon, now the, no, now the name request ID is known, and that is all we need. So we can use this curiously re recurring template parameter idiom. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> okay? And then uh, this using here is just to say that my request ID has all the constructors that the safe type does. So I don't have to repeat that code. So with this, I get the, the compilation error that I want. It just says no known conversion from receiver ID to request ID. That is good. And now, uh, Peter, would you please close your eyes for just 10 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> I actually hate the preprocessor, but uh, sometimes it's unfortunately convenient. <laughs> this saves yet some, yet, yet some um, boilerplate coding, so we can write this. It's not ideal, but the number of characters you have to write here compared to just using request ID equals UIN32T, it's, it's, it's just a handful more. So, this encourages my colleagues to use this because they don't have to write boilerplate code. That is good. And everything so far was quite OK. I was happy with this. Uh, it, it, it prevented a few, not, not many, I agree, but, but it prevented a few bugs. But then came the problem that I wanted a safe string. So I want to be able to label interfaces and say which, 
which network interface belongs to which cons customer. And the network interface has a name, and the customer has a name. Uh, and I wanted to use member functions, and that doesn't work. And I still, of course, want this safety. So I had this very brilliant idea, or so I thought, that I just expand this uh, safe type template to have um, a bool parameter that just uses simple introspection to see, can I inherit from it? And everything else before, and then I have partial specialization if it's true, and then I publicly inherit from it. Using to, to get the constructors and this uh, cross-construction safeguard with the templated constructor, and likewise for assignment and comparison, etc. So I got the problem solved. I was so smug that day. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, did I make a mistake. Anyone see what the problem is? Yes. That is true. Uh, I, could, I, I, could take, uh, a, I could take a reference to a, to a string and bind it to, to my name type and uh, use that to construct something else. That is true. That is very close. That, that is a very good observation. That is pretty much what is the problem, but I would say it in other words. I violated the list of substitution principle in a way in a rather reversed way, actually. This substitution principle uh, says, really, that it, let phi, be, phi of x be a property approvable of objects x of type t, then phi of y should be true for objects y of type s, where s is a subtype of t. OK, this is actually true. Uh, Uncle Bob, uh, Rob Martin, said pretty much what you said, that Functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it. And this is true. But it shouldn't be. Because customer name and interface name are different types that are implemented in terms of strings, but they aren't strings. There are many things we can do with strings that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to do with an interface name or a customer name. You, you don't want to get the next permutation. <laughs> no. So maybe it would, would make sense to, to make a type that allows access to, to all non-mutating functions so, that, so you can observe in any way you like. But definitely not to the mutating ones, because there are actually invariants here. And I missed those. So I expressed things as if they were equal, as if they had the same provable properties. But they don't. They don't have the same provable properties. They, they are different. So that was bad. <coughs> Questions, observations before going on? Peter. Yeah. Or other invariants, and it's like I said, you're using the string for implementation, but not, it's not. Yes. And if you define an abstraction, define the abstraction and don't cheat. Yeah, uh, Peter said in much better words than I did what I meant to say. <laughs> that, don't cheat. Don't fall into the trap of saying, hey, these are really the same things. I just want to be able to discriminate them. Because they aren't the same things. I have different invariants. So in, in Peter's words, don't cheat. You know, describe the correct abstraction. Uh, anything else? 
Okay, let's go scouting GitHub. Seen this fella? Jonathan Miller published a library, TypeSafe, that he uh, chose as slogan, uh, zero overhead utilities for preventing bugs at compile time. Yay. And you have the GitHub link there if you're not familiar with it. Uh, this is a very rich library for, for dealing with types. And you can piece together the behavior you want from your type. It's uh, arguably a little bit richer than the name implies. I think that there are many really good things in there that aren't really about type safety. So a little bit mixed there, but it has some really good stuff when it comes to type safety. And if I remember correctly, this uh, was not very long ago. So October 2016, what's that? Uh, a year and a half, a little bit more. So let's look into it. Um, if you include the header file strong type def dot HPP, you get this template that, uh, th th this is a public API, the full public API. So you can, Construct a strong default construct one or construct one from values, and you can convert const and non const L values and R value references. And everything that can be no, no except is, everything is explicit, everything is const expert. What's not to love? This means that if you just use and in instantiate a type safe object, you have something that is really just a handle. You, you, you can create it with a value, and you can extract the value from it, but you cannot do any operations on it at all. So the way you use it is include the, the header, of course. This is uh, for uh, mental sanity. Uh, he uses, uh, Jonathan Miller uses the same in his documentation. Uh, so. Pattern is familiar. My handle is a TS strong type def of my handle and an int, and I get the, all the constructors that strong type def has. But here's what blew me away a nested namespace called strong type def op, where you have bits and pieces of functionality that, that you can add to, to your types is to just say, yeah, by the way, my handle has uh, equality comparison operators. And of course, symmetric, not non-equality. And yeah, an and O-stream insertion operator is really neat too. I want that. And there are, I haven't counted how many of these there are. There are, there are quite a few. There are also some higher level type of uh, operations, if that is what you should call it, I don't know. So we can say that my int is a strong type def of int. And by the way, it's, a, it's an inter integer arithmetic type. Now here's a, a weird observation I made when I was experimenting with strong types in the code base where I work. I had no use anywhere in my entire code base for an integer arithmetic type. That felt odd. I will come back to what I do need instead later, because it's, it's not that, it's something else. Uh, since you also have, a, since you define a new struct, declare, Define uh, a new struct. You, you can add any member functions that you like, and maybe you want your own uh, stream insertion operator that is different from the one he provided. You can just add the function and use a static cost to get the value. Or you use the get function. The get function is overloaded for all const and non const R value, L value refs, so you, you get the right thing. So it's Quite convenient, easy to, to get what you want. Uh, so yeah, I, I like this. It's a, this is a very clever idea, I think. 
Then came another Jonathan. I don't know if it's a, an accident or, or what that both are called, Jonathan. Uh, maybe it is a requirement for writing these libraries. Uh, implement, uh, implementation of strong types in C++. Uh, this library is much smaller. So it's, it's not as rich by any means uh, as uh, Jonathan Miller's library is. Uh, it has some cool extra stuff, for example, if you have units that are strongly related in terms of that it's the same kind of type, you, you can make conversion, including nonlinear ones like what's to dBs, or uh, linear frequency to octaves, I don't know, uh, if that is your thing. And if you haven't seen his presentation from Meeting C++ in uh, November, Watch this video, it's amazing. So I'll give you a minute to take a picture. Right? The use is familiar. My handle is uh, fluent name pipes. All, all his stuff is in the namespace fluent. Um, if you don't know it, he writes a blog called, called Fluent C++. So it comes from there. He does one thing different, and that is the functionality you want your type to have is something you just add to the template parameter list. This means a, a little bit less um, repetition of code. If you remember Jonathan Miller's library, you had to say equality comparable my type. So here, here you just add them. Uh, you could, of course, use the, the CRTP uh, idiom if, if you want to. Um, and here's a weird one. You can say that I actually want my type to be implicitly convertible to int. It's ugly as heck, but and I'm not sure I want them to be. But if I want them to be, I have to be explicit that I want them to be implicit. <laughs> which I think is good, that then it's highly visible. Um, in uh, <coughs> Jonathan Bokara's uh, parlance, uh, these things comparable, printable, hashable, they are, he calls them skills. You can write your own skills if you want to. Uh, his his skills are on a slightly higher level of, of abstraction than uh, Jonathan uh, Miller's library is. Uh, to a personal reflection on these is that, that I think that Jonathan Miller's library is much more powerful. You, can, you have more fine-grained control, but it's more difficult to use for a non-experienced user. So swings and roundabouts, I guess. Uh, for this library, and also for Jonathan Miller's, uh, writing your own skills, if you want to add them, is not difficult if you're sort of used to writing template code. If you're not really used to writing templates at all, I guess it's difficult. I haven't tried to experiment on uh, my more junior colleagues. Maybe I should do that. Could be fun or I could maybe be responsible for new hires. I don't know. Um, anyway, that was that. I'm, I'm not going to dive in in any more detail about these libraries or other libraries. Um, questions before going on? You might as well ask because I'll need to drink anyway. Okay. Victor. Uh, have you actually ended up using one of those tools? Um, not in production code. I have not used them in production code personally because at work I already had that, that library that I showed earlier, um, which is, it, it's not as sophisticated, but it, it felt good enough. I also have, uh, 
I actually have one of my own, but I don't want to beat that drum because it's very, uh, very experimental. So don't go out and use that one. I'm not giving you the URL. But, uh, but I've experimented with that one also. Yes? Uh, yeah, I probably could use some, redefine the macro. Um, I just didn't want to go there, but, but you're right. You're right. I, I probably could do that. No. Anything else? Okay, so what happens with your code when you start using strong type? Because it changes your code at least if you're a, the kind of software developer the, that I am. Um, okay, I'm going to let you in on some of the secrets of my job. Uh, we make, as I mentioned earlier, we, we make network equipment, and one thing we really, really, really pride ourselves with is with that we know every segment of a network, how much capacity is used, how much spare capacity there is, so we never ever over-commission capacity. We consider packet drop to be an error. Uh, and the way we do this uh, is, uh, not going into details, but we have a unit, a, a measure of capacity quanta that we call a slot. And we pack slots together in frames the frames are typically not 24 slots. They are typically 24,000 slots. Uh, and uh, no, I'm not giving away uh, any secrets now. You can read about these in standards documents and patterns if, if that's what you want to do. Uh, what we have here in this frame is a green data flow and a red data flow. And we, I use the colors yeah, just to identify which slots in the frame are used for them. So we have some, we have some things that are important to us. We, it is important to know about indexes in the frame, and slot indexes. It's important to know about the count of slots, how many are there. So we can see that the green data flow is eight slots large. And since we do set arithmetics on these, we need to have a rather condensed way of representing the data and also to get the uh, operations to, to require as little computation as possible. So slot ranges are really important for us to, to say that, like this green one towards the end, we, we just say that it's this slot 13 and four more. So we have these types. Um, so we have a slot index, we have a slot count, and we have a slot range that really is just an index and a count. Um, the two boxes on the left are unfortunately pseudocode. We cannot write code like that in C++. I wish we could say type name, blah, blah, and then the compiler would know that, yeah, this is a type. It's not important if it's a struct or an enum or whatever, but that's not how the language works. But pretend it is for now. So, with this very brief introduction, look at magic numbers. Don't love magic numbers. So, I had code like this. I have a function available capacity, and of course I compare if available capacity is zero. What does zero mean here? It doesn't mean anything. It's, it doesn't have any semantics to it. Uh, I guess, as far as magic numbers go, zero is maybe the one you can get away with, but uh, why not be honest and say that if the available capacity is a slot count of zero? And if you listen to Kevin Hennis talk the other day, you know about Scandinavian keyboards and curly braces, you don't want to go there. So out of, out of nothing else than uh, saving your fingers and wrists from, from a breaking apart, you give it a name. And you should anyway. Yes, Peter? Are you going to continue with that condition? No, I'm going to leave that here now. What is your question? It would be to extract the condition to give it a conditional 
you wanted to give a name to the condition that, yes. Available slots. Yeah. Yep, I, I agree. It's better. To, that is even better. But I wanted to make a point about giving, removing invisible numbers, uh, magic numbers. But, but you're right. It's better to have a, a predicate that very clearly says if there are no available slots or whatever. Uh, that is better still. Just wasn't the point I wanted to make. <laughs> okay. Yes. That is okay. Uh, encapsulation. Using strong types helps you with encapsulation it, because the strong types are actual types, they're not aliases. So we had something like this. Uh, our communications protocols are, are binary protocols. You just pack things in, in condensed bit blobs. So we have a message buffer, we can serialize values into it, and we had a, a capacity that we want to stuff into a message buffer. And the, the protocol is designed such that a capacity is meant to be packed as 24 bits. And this code happened to be repeated in three, four places in the code base. Okay, it's not a total disaster, but it's bad. And the reason it's bad, of course, is that it's open to make a mistake. Happen to accidentally type 22 somewhere, or 32 is maybe more likely. And that is a bug that is difficult to, to find. So, but it's, since, since slot count is now uh, a strong type, we can make functions that we overload on it. So, so I can say serialized data with a message buffer and a slot count. That is done as 24 bit. And then we do the same for receiver ID, request ID, you name it. So we come to this agreement that the way to serialize data is to, to call a function called surprisingly serialized data. And you overload them for all your types. And then, of course, why not be a little bit more C++-y and say, yeah, we have a serialized member function that, that is a, a function template, and this, it calls this serialized data function. So now we can say buffer.serialize capacity. This helps, helps with one more thing. We are now staying, staying on a, a stable level, so to speak, of abstraction. What we're saying here is that I want to, in this buffer, I want to serialize a capacity, and I want to serialize a request ID, and I want to serialize I don't know what. We are, at this level, we're not bothered with the details of how are they represented in the message buffer. That, that is another problem, and we've hidden that, and that is good. So it makes a code more expressive in telling you what is it that is interesting here and now, and not other things. So you're more honest about what is important. What, what is it you need to pay attention to here? And now we come to the interesting bit. Uh, I will need some more water for this. Other questions before I go on? I mentioned earlier that I did not actually have a use for arithmetic types. So one thing that is important for us is these slot pools. Uh, and I want to be able to quickly query how, how much available capacity is there. So have a function release capacity takes a vector of these ranges, and I have a loop. And one of the things that happens is they're just add to the unused slots, but stupid, stupid, stupid strong type library doesn't allow me to do that. Uh, so I was a bit grumpy at that point, but then I started thinking, what operations do I actually want to do on these types? Is, is slot count a fully arithmetic type, or isn't it? So 
Do I want to be able to add slot counts? Yes, obviously, because I was upset about not being able to do that. So I want to be able to add them, and the result is another slot count. Subtract them. Uh, makes sense. I want that too. Do you want to multiply slot counts? No. It doesn't make any sense. Not, not in my universe, anyway. Maybe in some other universe it makes perfect sense to have slot counts squared, but, but not in my domain. So, no, we're not doing that. Do you want to scale it, multiply with the ratio? I have this slot count. I was three times as many. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Sure. Dividing slot counts, that is a bit exotic. But I guess if we have this large slot count and another one, I can divide them and find out that it's five times as large. Mm, a bit exotic, but, but I can see it. Divide by a ratio, well, I should, if nothing else for a symmetry reason, to get another slot count. Indexes, then. Do you want to add indexes? No, people shaking heads, no, don't go there. Slot index plus slot count. Yeah, that's what I said, how we describe a range. It, it is the green range at the, to the right here. It starts at 13, and there are four more. And after four more begins the next range that is the free range to the end of the frame. So yes, of course I want to be able to do that. So slot index plus account, that's another slot index. Don't want to subtract them. Yes. OK, this is getting a bit weird now. I don't understand what that would mean. So let's not go there. OK. I have no idea what that would mean. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to divide them by ratio either. It doesn't make sense. Slot index squared. Ah. Multiplied by slot count, no. No, we don't want to do any of these things. They, they're weird. I'm completely lost. What is the reason we don't want to add the slot indexes, but we want to be able to subtract them? Because, actually, hold that thought. I'm going to, there very soon, very, very soon. Um, the question was, why do I want to be able to subtract slot indexes and when I don't want to add them? Uh, yeah. Do you recognize a pattern? Have you seen something like this before? Everybody says that, and you're very nearly right. It's almost pointers. Uh, on a, Yeah, but pointer diff t is an integer type. You're allowed to multiply them, which is a weird thing, but, but you're allowed to. But, but the idea is there. It's just that the difference type is wrong. <laughs> Sorry? The chrono library, yes. What we have on the right are time points, and what we have on the left are durations. There you have the analog. And to answer your question about why I don't want to add indexes, it's like if we take these as being time points instead, 2 o'clock today plus 1 o'clock yesterday, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make sense. Whereas subtracting 2 o'clock today from 1 o'clock yesterday makes perfect sense. It's 25 hours. It's a duration. Did that answer your question? <laughs> this is not about C++. This is uh, how types relate to one another. So when I discovered this uh, coupling, there are two types that each of them by their own don't really mean a lot, but together, that they describe something. Uh, I felt that this is big. This is something that it, it, it must exist uh, 
a name for this. I'm not the first person in the world who have discovered this. It cannot be. I did not know, but I was not surprised to find out that in mathematics they describe this as an affine space. Uh, so an affine space is a geometric structure that generalizes the properties of Euclidean spaces in such a way that these are independent of the concepts of distance and measure of angles, keeping only the properties related to parallelism and ratio of lengths for parallel line segments. So what you can see is on a coordinate system, my types on the right, they are positions in th that coordinate system. And that is actually the terminology used in, in uh, affine spaces. It's a position type. And you can subtract two position types. And when you do that, you get a, a displacement vector, they call it. And you can, you can add vectors. You just sort of travel around. You can add a vector to a position, and then you get to another position. And you can subtract positions to get a vector. And if they are parallel, you can scale them. And if you then reduce this to one dimension, then there is no notion of non-parallelism. There is only one axis. So everything is parallel, meaning that the displacement types are always scalable. And I think this is a biggie. Uh, in my, when I applied my experimental library to my poor uh, source code at work, this was everywhere. I had so many of these type relations. So th this is a big one. I, I, I haven't explored this fully yet, but, but I think this is a really, really big one. I want to see more of that type type of type, uh, like the uh, chrono library that is uh, so great, I think, because it removes the possibility to, to make stupid mistakes. You can only do the operations that actually make sense to, to do. Do you think it makes sense to make a finite affine space library? Yes, yes, library? yes, I do think it makes sense to, if you, have a, a, if, if you have a library for uh, strong types, like, like I've showed you two from, uh, from GitHub, it makes sense to somehow have the ability to say that these two types are related as positions and displacements. Uh, and that is actually not very difficult to do. The difficult thing to do is to get names that are reasonable, that aren't like novels. <laughs> So, but I liked it. I, I should, in all fairness, say that even though I said that the, these libraries don't have this, uh, my exact example with uh, index and slot counts is supported by Jonathan Miller's library. He has a, a type that is an index type, and I don't remember. What was it? It might have been distance, he called it, but never mind. It, it said he, he has support for, for that, except, but, but not the generalization. Peter. And that's also a problem when you try to define a units library, where you have, let's say, three D vectors. One is the position, the other one is the displacement. And they look the same, but their purpose and their operations are yeah. not identical. Uh, Peter reflected on the, uh, the trouble with the interacting between such a library uh, on, that, that defines an affine space and a library that is a, a units library. So if we... No, it's actually for, you have the same problem when you want to have a good units library. Okay. That's why it's so hard to yeah. come up with something that works in general good enough it, for... Okay, so... Uh, the, the, it's, uh, it's difficult within a Unis library also. Uh, but it, it's actually something like, uh, if, you, if you look at the Chrono library as it is, it, it doesn't really make sense to be able to multiply durations because you get seconds squared. But, but in a Unis library, that is exactly what you want to be able to do. So, yeah, it, it is difficult. But... Um, Keep your eye open for affine spaces. This is a big thing, I think. Test code. Uh, 
So I had some example-based tests. Uh, capacity decrease is notified to clients. Uh, so we create two clients with uh, capacity five and eight, uh, and uh, we throttle the capacity, and we make sure that the callbacks are, are, are called in the notifications of the new capacity. This is messy code. Four, two, for which is which? For, uh, let's see, it's, uh, the first one is a request ID, the second one is uh, the capacity. Yes, good, okay. So yeah, I can make it a little bit better by saying that, yeah, but the, the request, that, that is a thing, I give it a name, and it has the correct type also, that is good. So now it has not only a name, it has a semantic meaning too. And then we have these numbers. We have all heard that uh, magic numbers are bad, so we define names for them. And for the love of everything that is sacred, don't ever do this to anyone. This is absolutely horribly unreadable, in my opinion. I think in yours too. Yes, I could give names like C8 capacity, C5 capacity. I think this is better, actually, honestly. Uh, that, sure, there are magic numbers here, but now there are magic numbers with a semantic meaning. And when we come to example-based tests, that is a, an important distinction, example-based tests. I think magic numbers actually make things easier to reason about the test, because I can see that yeah, I throttle the capacity to a five. I expect, I expect the notifications to be two and three. Two plus three, that is five. That is probably correct. Good, okay. And I create them with five and eight, and they become two and three. Yeah, yeah, that is probably a fair scaling. That, that makes sense, I think. So it's, it's much easier to reason about when you see these concrete numbers. But now they have a type, they have semantics, they mean something. Maybe we had overloads that took, I don't know, megabits per second instead, and it would be something very confusing. You could, of course, be super fancy and write your own user-defined literals and rewrite your code like that. I think this is cuteness for no gain, personally, but if it's your thing, why not? There's one question you haven't asked. I'm really surprised. I'm getting a bit bothered here. This is a, this is a C++ talk, you know. Okay. Sorry? Performance. Performance. Thank you. <laughs> No, I have no idea, sorry. Okay. You recognize this? I have a, I have a simplified thing here, much simplified. But I have, my, I have a safe type and conversion <coughs> operators. I've added uh, addition and subtraction. And I have three types here that are no, save types. And I made a slightly silly function that just adds to save types. Doesn't make a lot of sense, I guess. But if we look at the resulting code, I think, I don't think that is a lot of overhead, do you? And let's continue. It gets more interesting. I have a function that modifies data. Uh, it takes a, a, a parameter, non-const reference, int one. That is uh, modified by by the other two, plus equal minus equal. It's, yeah, it, it is a contrived example, but anyway. So we see that it it becomes a move and add a sub, a move and a return. So that seems good. We can compare it with uh, 
a primitive function. By the way, did you know that APIs defined in terms of primitive types are called primitive obsession? Don't do that. Uh, so we have a the function that is, a, for all pur purposes, exactly the same function, except that this one is using type aliases. We get a move, an add, a move, a sub, a move, a return. It's one instruction longer. So we have a negative cost abstraction. How often have you heard about that? <laughs> Any idea why? Compilers has to take aliasing into account. Yes, it, it's the aliasing rules. It, the compiler can assume that two values that are of different types must not occupy the same memory space. If they are the same type, they may alias to the same memory space, which means that when we use the strong types that are their own types explicitly, the compiler knows that there is absolutely no way two of these parameters are the same object. So it can optimize a little bit further. That is pretty cool, I think. So I have very little left to say. I just want to summarize and saying that what you already all knew, safety for the built-in types is, uh, I think abysmal is a to be too kind. It's terrible, absolutely horrendous. Everything converts to everything. But structs and clauses are exactly as strong as you want them. Everything is forbidden by default. You must add the functionality that you want. If you haven't added it, it doesn't exist. And there are libraries out there that makes life easier. That is good. And uh, those two I mentioned, uh, Jonathan Miller's and uh, Jonathan Bocaras, both are open source. You can contribute additions if there is something you find is, is lacking. And think about the operations that you want your types to, to support. Don't do file descriptor as int because it's stupid. Uh, like this example that I had with the uh, affine space, where we see that actually it's not the individual types even, it's several types that together mean something. And beware of that one, the urge for convenience, that, that trap I fell into when I said that I wanted my type to inherit from what it owns just to be able to get the uh, member functions. That is so stupid. Um, so sometimes, when you want to add something to, to get more convenience, stop and think, uh, what am I actually doing here? What, what does this code change I'm introducing meaning? Am I destroying something? And strong type leads to more expressive code. You have fewer magical numbers. You, have, you give names to things. You get better encapsulation, and you get tests that express intent. Sure, you can write them that, so that they better express intents also with type defs, but if you're anything like me, you forget to. With strong types, you don't have a choice. And be wary of that one. Type defs are no good. Thank you. Questions? No? Yes? Okay. I, I have one. So, would we be kind of we be weary though that because uh, we heard in other talks that C is maybe getting a bit daunting for uh, new programmers, that if we then have like, no, don't write this, use the affine space library, <laughs> combinator library for mm -hmm. your types. <laughs> Is there a risk that uh, introducing these notions, like the affine space, to, to less experienced developers that they uh, just run away because everything is too complicated? Uh, 
<coughs> there is such a risk, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, it, it's valuable. Uh, hang on a second. The, behind it. So, uh, you, I think right at the end of your case, you're using this folder scriptures. Um, would you rely on implicit operations for that, or would you provide overloads for every single POSIX function in this folder script? The if, if, okay, the, the question is, uh, the, with file descriptors, w would I like to have a conversion operator to, to int, or would I want overloads for all the uh, functions? Uh, actually, I think I would like a, a, a type hierarchy for file descriptors. So the, the most basic one is one that you can only close. And then you have readable and writable ones, and then you have bindable ones. With, I don't know what to call them. There will be a lot of names, but... <laughs> Uh, so I, I, would, I would describe the whole library in a completely different way. The, the, I, I wouldn't have the POSIX functions with, with, the, with, the t with the same parameters as they do now, I only change the type of, uh, of the f file, and file descriptor because that, that is a bad abstraction. It's called F-stream? It's called F-stream, except uh, how, do you, uh, how do you bind a socket to an F-stream? Uh, so, on a, and yeah, that's a reminder about um, pushing those type set value resets on, on uh, new programmers. I mean, it's, that is not only a problem in C++ because you should do this kind of stuff in any language. You shouldn't use variants or all different kinds of stuff in any language. So, I yeah. mean, it's about first about teaching programming, then using this as an example to teach the basics, and then go on and yeah. use Okay, for, for those who didn't hear, honest reflection is that the, the problem with these different types and their different abilities is, is not a C++ pro problem per se. You, you should think about these, you should have support for these in, in, in any language. Peter? Kevin Henney, patterns or value? The whole value pattern. Kevin Henney, whole value pattern, yes. I absolutely agree fully. Uh, more questions? Okay, you're free to go. Thank you very much. <laughs>